Welcome to The Advocate, a program that thrashes out all the topical issues of the day. When you are in government, you don't see nothing wrong mm, with exactly. whatever is happening. The moment you are out there, everything is that wrong. Is, you can't even see yes. many women now, and when they're there, they're not even really making a mark, and then they have an NYSC problem, and this is that. Really? It's disastrous for a president to, even say to be unaware. unaware of it, the chief it's justice. It's a ploy. It could be a strategy. That strategy it's was a terrible, like fire. A terrible <laughs> strategy. <laughs> because the box stops at your table. Whether it's that we don't look after our cities, and quite frankly, Nigeria is becoming a very ugly place. Mm. When you are the only one feeding the people with this news, and there is nobody countering them, it becomes, you know, the, the news. Welcome to The Advocate. We're fresh into the new year, and The Advocate is marking its one-year anniversary with a special edition. And I think we should be popping champagne at this moment. Well, today's panel consists of a fresh crop, albeit seasoned advocates in their different areas of interest. Shegun, also known as Segalink, popular or even notorious for his end SARS movement, will be tackling a matter after his heart the issue of creating safe spaces for our youth. Nafisa, convener of Girls Just Want to Run, will be exploring reasons why girls don't want to run. By that I mean run for political office. You'll agree with me that this matter gets more and more imperative with each passing year. Bright, founder of iCreate, is speaking for the youth. No surprises there. Essentially, he will be giving voice to the voiceless youth and enlightening us as to consequences for all of us of their remaining silent. Abimbola, nicknamed The Listener, will certainly be doing more than listening on this edition. She'll be reminding us to put first things first as she addresses the foundational matter of family. And I will be ensuring that woman matter becomes all of our matter as I table the essential matter of sanitary pads. Unexpected, you say? Well, the advocate is nothing if not unpredictable. See you after the break. The things we take for granted are sometimes the areas where the shoe pinches, except the wearer speaks out. I'm talking about sanitary pads for girls in schools. Now, sanitary pads are luxury in many homes in Nigeria. A pack of disposable sanitary pads on the average costs between 300 and 350 naira. For a three or five day menstrual period, girls will conservatively use two packs, consisting, I mean, rather costing 700 naira. In 12 months, that amounts to 8,400 naira. A woman with her two daughters will spend 25,200 naira yearly for disposable pads. And then we can imagine the cost if she has more than two girls. So many girls can't afford disposable sanitary pads, so they use washable cloth cut from anything. Pieces of material, some tailors, or foam cut from mattresses, and more. How many of them use these materials hygienically? That introduces the challenge of disinfectants to keep reusable cloths and other unimaginable materials used by girls germs-free. And disinfectants also cost money. So now more than ever, there is a need to supply free disposable sanitary pads or disinfectants to girls. Subsidize sanitary pads or just make affordable alternatives available to school girls in Nigeria. This will help both in rural areas and public schools in urban centers. Let's not even think of how women and girls cope in refugee camps and how much they need free sanitary pads. It's not cliche anymore that girls drop out of school because of lack of disposable pads during their menstrual periods. They also lack water and private safe spaces to change sanitary pads in schools. This is 2020. That magical year of the future, when everything is supposed to be possible and doable, is now here. And you may want to ask if this has worked elsewhere in Africa. Oh yes, it has. Kenya achieved that feat in 2017. And according to the BBC, Kenya stopped taxing sanitary products. For six years from 2011 to 2017, the government set aside funds to distribute sanitary pads to underserved girls. 
and there are templates across the world. There is Muruga in India, who fabricated an affordable sanitary pad making machine that has helped in getting affordable and quality sanitary pads to many in low-income communities. We want to take a look at KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa. They provide free sanitary pads to school girls. In Uganda, although the Museveni government balked, there's a sanitary pad factory making affordable pads for girls. Zambia and Botswana are making concerted efforts. Free sanitary pads is not a developing world matter. The Scottish government has launched a project to distribute tampons and pads to women who can't afford them. So my take, politicians should get real and factor this in when they consider empowering women with cash, as they often do. When they give 5,000 naira in this part of the world to a woman for empowerment, what exactly do they want her to use it for? Because for starters, it doesn't even buy her or her daughter disposable sanitary pads for a year. So I yearn for a policy on this issue. I therefore reiterate my call for affordable sanitary pads to girls in schools if we cannot make it free. And why can't it not be free? It is an item that clearly distinguishes a human male from female. It is associated with reproduction and the perpetuation of the human race. If condoms are free and are so easily accessible, why not sanitary pads? Right, so that, that's my take, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, Bright, what do you think? I didn't know condoms were free. <coughs> that's, I think, I didn't... Condoms, condoms, are, condoms are free? Again, in some places yeah, they're so free and they're, they're reasonably <laughs> I mean, they're, affordable. They're, they're everywhere. I mean, you can get it anywhere, but free? I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, th I, I think it's a very interesting. I think one of the most important things for me is the fact that I didn't even know this. Like, I've always focused on technology, innovations. I've never actually focused on what is going on when it comes to women, when it comes to, like, you know, what girls face, especially girls in rural areas. And just having to know this, I feel like I'm basically making a pledge right now and just saying, you know what? Aww, I'm going to make a 100,000 that pledge to, you know, I mean, maybe. <laughs> Um, 50 <laughs> girls next year, I don't know. But I, I think, you know, it's, it's on us. Um, this problem, you can't always wait for the government or... I mean, policy is important for... I mean, what you said about one of the countries that set up a policy to take out taxes, that's, that's a good that's one. That's Kenya. Yeah, that's a good one. So, apart from the government playing their role, citizens also should play their role. So, I think... Um, Thanks, It's good that we're talking about this. Nafisa, what do you think? Well, I think it's a really important conversation because you'll be shocked at how many young girls actually don't have access to sanitary pads. You'll be shocked at how many of them actually use tissue, even in urban Lagos. You know, it's a really serious issue. We don't even exactly understand what they might be going through because it's not just the hygiene, it's the emotional um, pathway that they have to go through. They are suddenly becoming a woman. They don't really understand what they are going through, and they might not want to tell people because other people might, you know, mock them. The and then, shame exactly, of it. The yes. shame. It's with, ordinarily it's not supposed to be a shameful event. So there is no like supportive network, and they don't really exactly know what to do. Some of them can't afford it. Even in Lagos, we have people that still use tissue. What do you say about the rural areas where, you know, like I said, you can't afford it or it's not just available? Right. No, this is something, I feel like this is something that should be a compulsory class in the junior secondary classes yeah. that both male and female should be aware of because it's not just enough to teach the young men how to take care of themselves and this is what is happening. It's also good to let the guys know that, hey, this is what is happening. So if something happens to her, be supportive about it. Don't make her feel bad. For example, when the girl can't stand up because she's probably yeah. stained and there yeah. are looks here and there and she's even more ashamed to mm. remain there. Exactly. You know, I think that's a that's a really uh, critical one. That mm. boys also should get educated okay. along yes. with the girls. Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, yes. I agree. I agree. I mean, it's amazing the things we take for granted, really. Yeah. And uh, even though I'm female, you know, the way this has been brought about has given a different perspective of what is really important when you have females around you, whether you're connected biologically or non-biologically. And very interesting what Nafisa said about the boys being aware, because there's so many things that these young ladies get into that because of the let's say stigma or the fact that you're stained or you're using a sanitary tower, it becomes as if you're, uh, you're an adult, you're this and that. So that awareness for the male, um, male gender also is very, very important. And, you know, the aspect of us also looking at things that, 
you know, are not physically seen outside. Because many of us females, we're more interested in what people say, our wigs, our makeup and everything. Mm. But the internal aspect is so important. And this advocacy is something that should spread beyond the physical. Very, very important. I actually think that um, because the conference season, the seminar and workshop season will soon start. We'll have the Women History Month. Mm -hmm. We'll have the International Women's Day and all the milestones, milestone days uh, in the new year. I think we'll do better as women when we organize things like this and make the kind of pledge that Bright just made, mm -hmm. you know, to critically, realistically intervene yeah. and advocate for some of the things we just give thoughts and we just say. Mm. So men, for starters, will start taking us you know, more seriously mm -hmm. and then we'll begin to make measured progress about some of the things we've been advocating for for years. You know, that's what I feel. Yeah. I, I think you, you're spot on there, especially with the um, revealing advocacy that you just you know, shown us here. And I, I think that I'm seeing from different perspectives here, as a father, as a business owner, as an advocate as well, that this, the policy angle of this must be done in such a way that every single person, whether you're male or female, begin to look at how this affects you. Whether you're, you're, you're a male or female, in fact, if you're a male, you're connected to at least three women in your life, your mother, your sister, your wife, your girlfriends, and all for those who have many. When you're talking about if uh, a case of condom being free or not, I was just saying, I have to phone a friend because I'm not really in that <laughs> department. You know, but it's one of those things that we need to be very concerned about this. How, how exactly, given the situation of the country, the economic situation now, mm -hmm. how, how are our women and ladies around us faring? Exactly. So how, where do we come in? We need to begin to take this to everyone's doorstep mm -hmm. and begin to make this advocacy our responsibility. Because until we take responsibility and bring these issues to the doorstep of each and every, mm -hmm. we don't begin, it, it won't drive policy. Because people don't really do what we expect but that which we inspect. Yeah. And until we make it a policy issue and hold our leaders to account to ensure that they come through for our children, for generations to come, and also for the people that we have in our society today who are connected to us, then it won't be a reality. And we just don't want to talk about this because women are the mother, mothers of our nation. And we need right. to take care of it. Many things we do as far, okay, you provide rice, you provide this, you provide that. These are things that also we can also um, make essential products, yes. so essential things that yes. we provide. Well, I just remember now uh, when I was in primary school back then, they used to give girls these things for free because I didn't know what it was. I was like, what's that? Can I have one of it? You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it should be free, for, especially for I think um, we, can, we can tax the um, companies as one of their CSR. Uh, exactly what I want to say. To yeah. get that available and to make sure that's available, especially for, for rural communities. Um, we have to wrap it up there. Mm -hmm. But who says what concerns one does not concern <clears throat> all? After the break, Shegun raises awareness about a matter that should definitely concern us all. And that's before the chickens come home to roost.